So my talk is called Learning to Live Again. I couldn't think of a better title. Tech, title, tech talk titles are really hard. Um, it's kind of a play on learning to love again. And I, I could kind of shoehorn in a reason why I called that. But really, I just couldn't think of a good name. And the whole gist of this talk is making the most of the live directory in a Rails app. So hello, my name is Brett. I work for a company. Actually, it's not a company. It's a nonprofit. We don't do business like that, called Charity Water. We are a nonprofit that is all about bringing clean water to people. And we work primarily in developing nations. And the kind of whole gist of it is, is that we do two things. We raise money. And then with that money that we raise, we issue grants and then work very closely with our partners to help install wells, install water filtration systems, and just improve the access to clean water to different folks. I work on, so we have two teams. Similar to how we have two goals, there's one team that works on fundraising, actually raising the money, and that's all public-facing projects. And then there's the internal team. I work on the internal team, and that means that none of the work I do is public, and you can't like, go to a website and see what I've done. But all the same, I really love it. I work on internal tools and tools for our partners. So I build tools to help our, for example, I'm working on this project that helps our growth team kind of manage their folks that donate money. And yeah, I'm working on a project to help support them. And I've also worked on a project to help support our partners with uh, our, our well monitoring system. So yeah, I work at Charity Water. They're out in New York City. I work remotely. So I just kind of work for my little, little room in Portland and really love it. I've been programming for 10 years. I started programming when I was in high school. I was lucky enough to have an AP Computer Science course, actually AP Computer Science 1 and 2, in my high school. So that kind of got me started, and I haven't stopped since. I was learning Java at the time, and while I was thinking back to that 10 years ago, I remember I had a teacher who would review our code by us printing it out. So we would have to print it out, and he would take a pen and write where we had wrong code. So of course I had to compile first because it was Java. I don't know if you could do that with Ruby, but anyways, I haven't really done much code printing out since, but some fond memories. I started programming with Ruby on Rails five years ago. The kind of gist of my story is, is started learning Java. You know what I thought? I thought I wanted to make video games. So I went to school for making video games where I was doing C++ and ActionScript 3 and C Sharp. And during that time, I had this apprenticeship. Before, it looked like, so when I was an apprentice, it was before, like, I don't know, the people who, who thought that they should hire an apprentice thought it was cool to hire an apprentice. And I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I just thought it was an, an internship. but. It was kind of this never-ending apprenticeship. And during that time, I started using Ruby and Rails. And the first project I ever worked on was a gem. And that'll kind of play into the talk. But I started doing Ruby and Rails. And I eventually thought, hey, <laughs> school's really, really expensive. You know what I should do? I should just not do this. And I should just start working. And so I started working. And five years later, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm still here. And I'm still doing it. And still loving it. So uh, do not recommend that, though. It's been a very strange and difficult five years. So don't, don't just leave school <laughs> unless you're really feeling it. Uh, <laughs> probably the most notable thing that I'm proud of over the past five years is I organized this conference in Burlington, Vermont, called the Burlington Ruby Conference, which I see some familiar faces. And it's just a really fun way to get to know folks. And folks from all over the country would come. And we would just have a good weekend and learn a lot about Ruby. And I really love the Ruby community. It's, it's something special. It's <laughs> really quick aside, I worked for an organization that used like this non-open source proprietary software, and I went to a conference for it, and <laughs> everyone was in suits, which there's nothing wrong with people being in a suit, you know, but there was just, people were there because their work made them go, and the Burlington Ruby Conference was people that were there because they wanted to be there, and there's something about Ruby community, like tonight, where folks just seem happy and they're excited to be here and take time out of their Tuesday night to do this. So that's something I really enjoy about the Ruby community. I recently traded the snow for the rain. So I used to live in Vermont. Now I live in Portland. I moved here in November of this year. I really like it here. The climate is more mild. And the folks are nicer, I guess I'd say. Folks in Vermont are nice, but there's something, I don't know, something about the West Coast. People are really nice. So really loving it in Portland. So thank you so much for having me. This is probably the most technical talk I've given. Usually I give talks on like, Git and like you know useful Git commands, which I guess is kind of technical, but this is more like deep in Ruby and Rails, and hopefully it goes well. So this whole talk is about a directory, which is kind of boring. I don't know. I like files and folders. I think they're very interesting, and 
So I don't know, your mileage may vary on this talk, so in how interesting it is to you, but it's all about this directory. I'm going to tell you what this directory is for, why I think it's really important, the really good parts about it, and the few bad parts about it, and just how I've used it and how you could use it too. So for years I thought the lib directory was just for rake tasks. When I work in a Rails project, the only thing I would use in lib would be rake tasks. And maybe it was for a data migration, or maybe it was for a nightly job. Maybe it's on Heroku and you set up the scheduler, and you're not using like Sidekick or something uh, to schedule it, so maybe you use that, right? And that's what rake tasks were for. And that's what lib was for. But these days, I work so much in the lib directory, I don't even remember the Rails generators. It's just like, I think over the past few years, I've written significantly more code in lib than anywhere else in Rails projects. And it's changed the way I look at Rails, and I think it's made me a better Rubyist and a better programmer. So traditionally, if you create a new Ruby gem, you put your code in the lib directory. And here's this really simple gem that prints out the current time. And as you can see, in the lib directory, there's just one file, right? And if you were to look at another gem, there'd be however many files there need to be. But this is traditionally what the lib directory is for in a gem. And it's very straightforward. Like a gem kind of has some other files, but they're kind of all secondary. The lib is the place you want to look. And that's just what this code is. It literally just prints out the time in a way that I can read it that is not date. I don't know the date command. I'm not a computer, so this prints it out in like a human readable way that I really enjoy. So that's all this does. But I just want to show this is how simple lib can be, right? It can just be a class that has one single class method. And when you create a new Rails project with Rails new, the lib directory has two directories in it with nothing in it. You have the assets directory, which I don't think I've ever seen anyone use. But, but that doesn't mean you can't use it. You could take all the things I'm going to talk about and use it for your assets. But I'm not going to talk about that because I've never done it. So, you know, venture forth and try new things in the assets directory. But that's that's or that's new ground for me. But and then there's tasks directory, which, as I talked about, is for rake tasks. But I think the lib directory can be used for so much more than those two things. And it's kind of sad that there's nothing else in there. But it's also kind of exciting because it's this whole blank landscape of where you can put all your code. And the lib directory is really great for code that does not fit in the Rails paradigm. So it's really good for things that are not models, not views, not controllers, not mailers, and not jobs. Which, you may be thinking, wow, that's pretty much everything you need to build a web app. <laughs> you're wrong. No, you're not wrong. <laughs> Actually, I think a lot of, that got me like very far, right? And that's great, and those serve their purposes very well. But the lib directory is for anything that's not that. And we'll talk about examples of code that doesn't fit into those. So lib can be used for just about anything, which isn't very helpful. <laughs> so here's the times when you should actually use lib and when I think it really shines. So if you're working on a project that feels like it could be its own gem, that's when you should use lib. If you're asking yourself, could this code be used by other projects internally? Like let's say you have many applications, many Ruby applications. Could the code you're writing, do you have some kind of logic or, uh, I don't like the term business logic, sorry. I'm going to say it probably a couple times. If you have business logic in your code that you can apply to other parts of your <laughs> other code bases, maybe it could be a gem, right? And then you could just require that gem and it's magically there and you're not duplicating this code. Lib is really good for that. Would it make a good open source library? That's a great time to use lib. And we'll talk about why. Because when it's in lib, it's not open source unless your project is open source. But it's this really good transition path to creating an open source library. So let's say we have this hypothetical application. I don't have a name for this application, but it's my brand new startup. I actually started it yesterday. And it is brand new, and its core, core business value is it helps you send faxes. And it uses this third-party service called Faxly, because there's a service for everything. And Faxly is this theoretical service that actually probably exists. And it helps you send faxes. But they are so new, and they are a node shop. And they don't have a Ruby gem. They just have an NPM package, which was a big bummer when I started my startup. Not, a, not good business advice. but. We must venture forth. It would so be nice if there was a gem to make working with Faxes API easier. Instead of just having net HTTP calls all over, what if instead there was a gem? What if that gem looked like this? It had a namespace and Faxly, and there was a client that you could initialize with a credential and a secret, kind of like AWS. And then with that, you could send a fax with the send fax method. That's way better than making an HTTP call to some URL. And then you specify who you want to send it to, and then this body of what you want your fax to send. That would be so nice, but that doesn't exist. So you should put it in the lib directory. That code is external to my hypothetical app that has nothing defined about it, but when you're working on a real project, you know like within the app directory, what Faxly does isn't, it's kind of tangential to your application. So 
don't put it in your app directory, put it in the lib directory. So you create a directory called Faxly in your lib file, and then it's just like building up that Ruby gem. So in it, you'd create your client, and that would live at lib Faxly client, and you'd define your namespace, which corresponds to the file structure, which is really nifty, and then you create your class. And this mirrors that code that I had before. It doesn't actually do anything, but you know, this is what your little client could look like. And it is way easier to extract that code and the tests that correspond with that code into a gem when the time comes when they're built independently of Rails. So if it's all tied and mangled in the app directory somewhere and it's all relying upon Rails and you have to extract that, that's very, very challenging. But beware of extracting it too early. What if you just started building it from a gem from the start though, right? Instead of extracting it later. There's some really big downsides to that and I want to share what. So, there's this big overhead to maintaining a separate gem that I think might not be something you realize until you actually do it. Oh my goodness. Sorry, it's not like something fell. So there's this overhead of maintaining a separate gem that I don't think is worth it from the start because I've actually worked in a project very recently where people are like, yeah, open source, we'll create this gem and it'll be great, we'll do it right from the start. And then you have to issue pull requests to this gem, work in another project, set up RuboCop twice and do all this stuff that's like, you're just trying to get this project started, right? And get it done by the deadline or you know, the hypothetical deadline. So if you're building a private gem that you share internally, you either need a private gem server or a private Git repo, which private gem server is not too crazy, right? Maybe you have your own infrastructure, you can set that up, and I think there's actually tools to do that. You could fork rubygems.org, and you could set that up if you wanted. You could actually just use the Git URL. So Bundler in your gem file, you can use a Git URL with, if you're using GitHub, you can use an auth token. So it's not too bad, but there's overhead to it. And if you go and then update that, that private gem, you either have to you know, cut or build a new version, as they say, and then you have to go and then update that in your actual project you're working in. So there's like this kind of like little overhead that can distract you from what you're trying to do. If it's a public gem, do you have the time and energy to support it? So if someone's opening issues because it doesn't work with the latest beta of Rails or whatever, like you know, you have to realize that when you make something public, you're not committing to maintaining it, but you have to interact with people and that takes time and that might not be what your whole organization is about or what your personal endeavor is all about. So there's overhead to that. And if you're gonna build a gem for this new Faxly service that services everyone because it's open source, that takes a lot more time and code to write that's more general than just writing the code that you need to actually move forward with your project. So again, there's overhead and there's, it can be distracting. So when you need to make changes and it takes longer, you're actually <laughs> decreasing your kind of, uh, I hate this one's word, velocity of your project. <laughs> and that's not good. So what I'm saying is you should open source your projects, but you should do it when it feels right and you should do it when it's stable and you're not just making commits multiple times a day or multiple times a week. But once that part of your code in the lib directory has stabilized, then go, okay, great, I'm gonna put this in a gem. Maybe I'll open source it. Maybe it'll just be for internal, but do it when it feels right. And you will know when that feeling's right if you've ever not done that. So. <laughs> When you start feeling the pain, then you'll be like, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that until it's actually ready. So I was talking about jobs, and remember I was listening at the different parts of Rails that you don't <laughs> wanna use live for? There's a star next to jobs, because I think jobs are actually just like a thin wrapper that lets you interact with some of the nice things Rails gives you, but doesn't actually create a coding structure that <laughs> actually results in good code. So the app jobs directory is where your code should go. An active job makes that really nice, right? Which is a new, newer Rails feature that abstracts away different queuing systems, right? An active job is great. You can do that with Rails, and a new Rails project makes that pretty straightforward. So you don't want to put your job code in somewhere else unless you have good reason to. And in a hypothetical app, let's say this other hypothetical service called DropCube, and it's a file sync service not too dissimilar to Dropbox. And what it does is it backs up your faxes before they get sent, because you do not want to lose a fax. If you're still sending faxes and you lose a fax, you, your business is probably done. So <laughs> you, this is like top tier, like credit card security level importance. So you don't mess around with it, so you wanna back it up. And here's our job, I love this code. So you take your facts, you prep it for PDF transformation, you use my magical new class called PDF Wizard, which, you guessed it, creates a PDF. You set all the attributes, you determine where you wanna save it, hopefully you create a place in the user's DropCube account that is unique and doesn't overwrite the file, the, fa the facts that they sent today. Again, so maybe you gotta secure random hex, and you have this other DropCube client which maybe lives in lib or maybe DropCube is good enough to have their own one. And then you put the file there. That's really bad code. That's like, to me when I see that, I'm just like, ah, that's really tough for a lot of reasons. It's tough to really handle anything in it. So you wanna delegate that code to 
classes in lib. And when I think about that code, how would you write tests for that? It's trying to do eight things. And that perform method, if something goes wrong and something blows up or an exception is thrown, how are you going to debug that? It's like you don't know where it's going and then how to write the tests that fail to actually repeat that behavior. So the perform method is doing a lot. So what if we used action classes, which action classes, I don't know if that's a real thing, but I just call it that. It's classes that do a specific thing, they do it well, and they usually have a verb in their name. So what if we refactored it to look like this? Perform actually uses two classes. One class that creates a PDF, called creates PDF, pretty straightforward what it does. And then we have one that syncs to Dropcube. And what does that do? It syncs to file Dropcube. And now what you have is two classes that do two things and hopefully do it well. Now this is what it used to look like. This is what it now looks like. So the scope of perform has decreased in terms of the code that's actually being executed, but the, the goal is still the same. And now that's really easy to test because now you have to maybe stubber mark out two things, right? And it's about the way, way the data is flowing and letting the unit tests for each of those classes do the things that they need to do instead of worrying about writing one really big test. And then if you want to change that, like let's say you want to go back and change a really long job, ah, that's like infuriating, especially if you have to have logic and like when you have these classes that do each thing nicely, then you can add the logic where it needs to live. And those files would live in the fax backup namespace, and there'd be creates PDF and six to drop cube RB. So yeah, just live right there. Follow the names, and that's it. So the lesson there is you create these classes to handle the work for non-trivial jobs. If you have a job that's just taking an object and then setting an attribute and saving it, you might not need to create a class for that, but maybe you'll feel so inspired to do it, you'll just do it. So. Follow your heart. Next up is this thing known as skinny controllers of five models. I hate this name. I will not use this name again. I won't say it. So when I say SCFM, that's what I'm talking about. This was like the way I learned Rails. This was like people be writing blog posts like, oh yeah, use SCFM. It's like, it's like the way you want to write your code. And maybe this is like a thing people don't learn anymore. But this is like so ingrained in my brain about how you should write your Rails code that it took me a long time to get rid of it. So what SCFM is all about is you have these really complex controllers, controller actions with all this logic. And you have these if statements and loops and maybe you're triggering jobs and saving things to the database. And SCFM is all about taking that and putting in your model. So what you then get is these models that are just all knowing, extremely complex, and hundreds and hundreds of lines. So those are what people call God objects. Also, don't love that name. But anyways, they're all knowing and they just have so much logic baked into them. And that is the worst. Like, if you can't feel like you can change your models because it's related to another model and you're just like in callback hell, then it's just like, ah, oh, what are you doing? You can't change anything. So you don't want your models to go crazy. And I think SCFM is really bad advice. And I wonder what I should do. Put it in lib. That's right. You basically take all that code and you put it in the lib directory. And just like jobs, you just create action classes. Action classes are the thing. So here's an example from a real app that I worked on. This app is a real app that our partners use at Charity Water. So a uh, little, little side story. We got this grant from Google to build this sensor. And I have nothing to do with the sensor. That's probably way harder work than I've ever done, where you're actually like writing C, and it's working on this hardware, and it's monitoring water flow. And then it sends it to this API. So I built the app that consumes that API. And if a, water, if a well stops having water flow, it, a ticket gets created. And the ticket is for a real human being, maybe in Ethiopia, to go and fix that well. And there was all this code throughout the app for the logic of completing a ticket. So in a controller, in a job, in this processing thing in the corner. And making a change in one place meant you had to make this change everywhere. So what we created was a ticket completer. And what does it do? It completes tickets. <laughs> it takes a ticket, finds a project, and then it has a little logic in there. So everywhere, then it becomes tickets completer dot new, pass in the ticket, and then you complete it. And now that's everywhere, just a single line of code with an object that does what it's supposed to do and do that one thing well. So this is a really good example of it. Maybe you have other, other examples in your application where there's kind of like, oh, you have a normalized column and you're setting it in your controller and then you have to create a job that handles it in the background. So you duplicate that code. Maybe you can create a module or a class to handle that and dry it up. Another thing that Liv is very good for is avoiding new paradigms in the app directory. So these are things that I've seen before. I've seen app services, app presenters, app forms, app queries. And ah, what do they mean? What is a service? Is that related to a microservice? Are they mounting Sinatra projects in their app? And that lives in services? Is it something else? Is it a job? 
what is a presenter? Probably view helpers, which maybe be a thing, right? I think there's a gem called Draper that adds that. And if you're using gem that adds a paradigm to app, then you should use it. <laughs> so don't take your gems that you're using and just say, hey, no, I'm not doing it that way. You probably want to do what they suggest. Like Pundit uses policies. Don't, don't fight that. But things like forms, things like queries, it's just like, I don't know what they're doing. They're too generic, right? And when you're working in a code base and you have to write code and maybe it's complex, so you're like, oh, this should be extracted somewhere. You have to figure out what directory it goes in. That's, it's just too hard. So I'd say don't worry about fitting your code into some generic noun or even creating a new noun to classify it under. Instead, you create action classes and those action classes are going to live and lib. And once more and more of those action classes get created, then you can look into refactoring. And that new refactoring doesn't, like that new organization or classification of code doesn't have to live in app. You could put it in app or you could just put it in lib and have it just live in lib and you know, be happy there. There's no ups or downs to it. And the reason why I think this is really important is when I started using Rails, it took me so long to understand MVC. I still don't know if I know it. Like, I know it, but like, there are times when I'm like, where does this go? And then I'm like, then it goes in the lib, because that's usually the, <laughs> there's your sign. So that's the kind of gist of that. And, and so I, was, I always thought to myself, I'm just a dummy who hasn't done software in a legitimate way before. You know, I never learned anything else. Rails was my first web framework. So I learned HTTP, Ruby, Rails, everything at the same time. And I was like, that's why it took me so long to understand MVC. And then I started learning Ember last, no, two years ago, started learning Ember, and Ember is like MMVVCMC, and like has so many concepts, and they're not the same as, as Rails. So you're like, oh yeah, this is a view, but actually in Ember, that's a template. And I, I understand why they exist, and the convention is important, because then you can write about it, and you can talk about it, and it's a common thing that's useful, because you're using them all the time. But if you're an individual working on an application, and you're introducing those new concepts, you have to expect that you're going to confuse some folks, especially when they're new folks that join your projects. So, that's kind of what I think about is like, you're writing code not for yourself, you're writing code for everyone that's ever gonna work on that code base. And when you introduce new concepts that don't exactly right away scream what they do, it can be very hard for new people to find what that does and where that code is. So, it's difficult to understand. So when it doesn't fit nicely in the Rails paradigms, you put the code in lib. And I see that's, that's, that's like the core line of when you should use lib. If it doesn't seem like it fits into what Rails gives you, put it in lib. And using with Rails is actually pretty easy and straightforward. You could require the things that you usually need, like if you ever used require. And if you're using Rails, you probably don't use require too much. So maybe you don't know what it is. So maybe this will kind of be a good like intro to require. Require takes code, and whether it's a gem or it's code in lib, and it actually lets it so the classes have access to it or the modules have access to it. So you could require the code everywhere that you write in lib. But as I said, you don't usually do that in Rails. Why don't you do that? Because Rails auto loads everything, for better or for worse. All you need to do. I'm just going to hang on this slide for 10 seconds, is add this to your config application RB. This is the magic line. You'll Google this and you'll find other answers. They do not work. They don't work with Spring or they don't work on DigitalOcean. Or like you, you know, there's always something that doesn't work. And this is the magic one that has worked for me over the years. And what it does is it takes the code and lib and it auto loads it and eager loads it. Everywhere. So it's accessible. So then those requires go away. So this becomes that. I guess that's nice. I don't know. We'll talk about why it's not so nice soon. But if you're kind of lazy like I can be, that's kind of nice. And when you're in the lib directory, it's all blank, which I think can be intimidating, right? Because when you start a new Rails project, you have all the MVCs and the jobs and all the other things that Rails creates for you, which is really nice because you're like, oh, I know where that goes. But in lib, there's literally nothing, which can be intimidating. So you create those directories and you create those namespaces that correspond to those names and concepts. But don't sweat it. I absolutely hate the saying of, oh, the hardest thing in software is naming things and caching validation. Like, who cares what you name it? Just name it what it does. And if it's a really long name and it gets tiring to write, then you change it. The thing about naming so code is like you can change it. And if it's an internal private thing, like name it foo bar and like literally go and change it the next day after you sleep on it. And like, don't sweat that stuff, especially when you're putting stuff in lib. Like just put whatever you want there, call it whatever you want, as long as it describes what it's doing. And lib is super great for that because you're not worrying about something like, oh, I put it in models. Lastly, the big concept that I like to talk about lib and why I love lib, so all this other stuff has been really great, right? Lib has a lot of purposes. The thing I love about lib is the testing of it. And it's very similar to testing any other classes and models. And it's all gonna be an R spec. Nothing against mini test or test unit. Every project I've ever worked on, and that's probably been like 10 projects, has always been R spec. And I think, I assume, and it's probably assuming wrongly, folks probably know R spec the most, but I think a lot of things we're gonna talk about apply to the other testing frameworks. So in our spec, you have your faxed client. You would put it right in spec lib faxed client spec. 
It just follows it one-to-one -one with your spec. And you'd write it just like normal, right? This code isn't really important, but it requires the Rails helper, and you describe it, and you test it. And it's just like writing any other test. And when you run, run Rails generate RSpec install, which sets up RSpec for your Rails project, it creates two files. It creates your spec and spec helper. It creates your spec helper and your Rails helper. Your spec helper is general RSpec configuration, right? That is not specific to Rails, it's just RSpec. And then your Rails helper is specific to Rails and it also requires a spec helper. So when you make changes in your spec helper, those come into your Rails helper. So it's really nice. It's a more recent thing, I think, but it's really important to know. So when you require your Rails helper, it loads the entire Rails environment and every gem that's required in your gem file. So when you do gem breakman, that loads the gem automatically, right? If you just write that line. If you do gem breakman require false, it doesn't load that gem automatically, which is really important because if you're not using breakman anywhere in your code or many places in your code, when you run tests with Rails helper for another piece of code that doesn't use breakman, breakman is still getting loaded up because you're requiring it globally for your app. So this is just an important distinction to make. And when you start thinking about like, hey, what code is getting loaded up when you actually start Rails or run your test suite, this changes a lot. So it's kind of fun to go and like not require everything and uh, see how fast it gets and then actually just require it where you need it. So when you normally write a spec, right, let's say we're testing our controller, which is within the domain of our Rails app, it's tight, tightly tied to Rails, you require your Rails helper because you want to have Rails so you can test the full stack. But that's so slow and unnecessary when you're testing code in lib. So when you're testing code in lib, you can just require a spec helper. And that looks like this. You require spec helper instead of Rails helper. You'll notice that second line of require faxed client because when you do require Rails helper, it's loading up everything in your gem file and everything in lib because we had that configuration. Now it's not doing that. Now it's just trying to run whatever's in this code that, that this spec file has access to. So you have to require faxed client because that's the class that's under test. If you were to use another class within your spec, you'd also have to require that or have faxed client require that. So it can get complex, but it's kind of a necessary evil for this. And it means faster tests. So how much faster? I'm running this with the time command, and these are without spring, and I'm running time bundle exec like rspec path to the file. And the app that I'm using has 28 required gems, which is not that many. I've probably worked on projects with like hundreds, and I'm sure people know what that's like when you have to run bundle update and one of them breaks and like, yeah. So this is just a 28 required gem gem file. With Rails Helper, you see, hey, it ran. The first thing you see is it took 0 0.07 seconds to run. Wow, that's so great, fast test. Especially when my test suite takes 20 minutes to run, I'm happy to sit there and wait for 0 0.07 seconds. But then the next number you see is it actually took 5.6 seconds to load. So your test didn't take long to run, but it took a long time to load. And the real thing we care about is the real time, convenient naming. It actually took 6.598 seconds to run the whole test suite, so like 6.6 .6 seconds. That's the thing we care about, because that's how long you're sitting there and not writing code. Now when we do it with the spec helper, the tests take about the same time to run in terms of actually running our spec, but the loading up of everything takes significantly less time. It takes less than a second for everything to run. So that's a six point time speed increase when you're running your test, and that's really good. Now if you're using a Rails helper with Spring and you're running, hey, Spring, Spring is so great, I love it, it never breaks on me, I love Spring so much. <laughs> You're thinking, this saves everything. I don't need to do this. Spring actually isn't that much better. It still takes 3.8 .8 seconds to do. So that's still four times slower. And four times is a lot. And while that's a quantifiable number, and maybe you know things like four apples is more than one apple, but you, this, with, with time, it's kind of different because our brain, the way our brain works and, and how we write code and how we type, like time is not a concrete thing. So well, four times may not may seem like a lot, or it may not seem like a lot. It makes such a big difference when you're doing TDD, and that four times speed increase is the difference between you writing your next test and then writing the next code that makes that test fail, or actually writing the passing code to get the, writing the code to make the pass test. So that makes a huge difference. And I think the best thing that I know with this is when you run your specs after writing code, and then your brain starts to wander, and you're like, oh, I could open Twitter. Or, oh, I could go check this Twin Peaks fan site that I really like. That's your, that's your downfall because you are now not thinking about the thing that you were thinking about. And that, when you're doing TDD, is such a huge, huge thing. So I'm only, I, only, I love this so much because the project I'm working on now, every single thing is in lib except a few things because it's largely a like, processing app. And 
I was requiring Rails Helper because I was being lazy. <laughs> and I was sitting there, I was like, oh, okay, running my tests. And then I was preparing this talk, and I was like, oh, wait, I know about this thing. <laughs> I should actually start doing this. So the past two weeks, I started doing it, and like it makes a total difference in terms of just the speed at which you're working through the things that you're working on. Things to note, if you require Spec Helper everywhere, but you're still running your entire test suite with like a Cucumber or just integration tests, that doesn't really change the speed of your test suite when you're running your whole suite. It's just those individual runs for that file that really makes a big difference, because Rails has to be loaded anyways. And, as I showed earlier, you have to explicitly require things. And you could kind of create like a manifest, which a coworker of mine suggested you create a manifest file and just require things and keep it really lightweight, so you can kind of be like half lazy. So, you know, you can try different things out. Lastly, as we're coming in the home stretch, I just want to talk about a few real recent uses. Dropbox sync, kind of like your Dropcube sync. I worked on this project called Notably, which is a social network for parents, and what you do is you take photos and videos of your kids and you post them online. And you really don't want to lose photos of people's kids and videos of people's kids. And when they do, people get very upset. So what I did was built Dropbox sync. So whenever someone, you know, this kind of code, hypothetically, looked like photo gets created and controller action. That asset's on S3, AWS S3, it's a file hosting service. Then a background job gets triggered. That background job delegates to lib, and it was probably called Dropbox Sync, the namespace, and then I probably had like sync file, and then within sync file, I probably delegated to other classes that checked if the user is associated with Dropbox. Do they have an account connected? If they do, great, then we'll continue syncing. If not, just happily end. Then it'll try to put the file. Well, that's great if it's all in one job at the first start, but then as it gets more complex of, does the user have enough space in their Dropbox account to actually put those files? Or does the user, uh, or is Dropbox down, right? And if it's like, if the, if the software just like throws the ball at the wall and it doesn't make it over, but it's like a picture of someone's kids, like you want to try that again, right? You don't want to just like have it die and not, not get backed up because they'll be like, where's that picture of Jane? Like, where'd it go, <laughs> right? And then you start to lose trust in the services that you use. So what I'm trying to say is you add logic to your code to make your software more trustworthy, and I think it's really easier on lib. And so Dropbox Client Sync was a really good thing for that. Another project I'm working on, we have an internal API that hosts all our project data, and that's written in PHP, and so there's no Ruby gem, and there's no Ruby code I could extract. I couldn't you know, create this tool to use across our different projects to interface with that API. So what I did was I put it in lib, created the namespace, and wrote the code, and now when another project that is in Ruby needs that code, I can just extract it into, you know, client X, and then we can use it where we need it. So super, super good use for that. I won't talk about this one too long, but another project I worked on, we had table headers that are really all sortable, and the URLs need to be bookmarkable. So it all had to be in the URL. And there's like not a lot of JavaScript in this app, so it was all kind of, it was using Ajax or PJAX. It was using something, something like that. And you could sort all the table headers, and it was really, really rough code beforehand. So I created this thing called create sortable table headers, I included just the part of Rails that is a URL helper, which I think is like active support. I don't know. One of those, or maybe it was like a view helper. I just included that and required just that so the test still ran fast while I was building it. And then I built up these sortable table headers. So it's all like model backed. And uh, yeah, kind of neat use that isn't just like client. It's actually built in the front end or using the front end. Really lightweight AWS S3 client wrapper. I'm not trying to hate on the people who built the S3 gem, but like it's not very nice to work with in my opinion. It's not very friendly when you're just like trying to get a URL or upload a file. So you can create like a really nice little wrapper for S3 in the Ruby gem to get the URL or upload a file. So yeah, like if you ever have something where you're like, oh, this is such a pain, put it in lib. <laughs> the project I'm currently working on, which I kind of alluded to, is this extractions form load app, which those are three buzzwords in my mind. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm building an app of buzzwords. But what it does is it takes data from something, they extract, transforms it, which is like this big hash manipulation, and then it makes a post request and loads it somewhere else. And built it in Rails because Rails has all these nice things like people know where things go, if it has to you know, have a model or a web UI, and then I think the way we, Rails hand, handles rate tasks and just, there's something nice about Rails and familiar with Rails and we use Rails. So built it in Rails, everything's in lib. It's been super great, test speed. So there's maybe like 500 test examples and they run in like 10 seconds. So it's like, ah, it's really good. And if you're trying to look at this online tomorrow at work or tonight, Chef Supermarket, which is a project I worked on, there's some code in lib. And this is kind of like, this is maybe two years ago. This is kind of where I got started thinking about this and other people were doing this and that's where I kind of started to see it. And there's some references in here. I think a lot of Supermarket could probably be moved to lib, but I don't work on that anymore. So um, 
But that's the only open source thing I could really find to share. And then any Ruby gem, I think RuboCop is a good example because it's kind of complex and does some nifty things with the code. But any Ruby gem is a great place to look at libcode. And if you're using a Rails project with gems, you can actually just open those gems locally and check out the code. And you can change that code, but actually don't do that. But you can do it if you're trying to debug something. So in conclusion, please give it a try if you're interested. I think it helps you write smaller and more modular code, which I don't know, I feel like people always talk about that. So maybe you should do it. It treats me well. <laughs> it feels more like Ruby programming than any other part of Rails. And that's the thing that I really love about this is I think Rails is a great gateway to Ruby where oh, I want to build a web app. Oh, you should use Rails, it's really nice. And Ruby, mini swan, and you know all that stuff. But you don't actually use Ruby for like the first couple of years you use Rails. You're doing active record and you're trying to figure out controllers and trying to figure out the whole life cycle of a request and where it all goes. But then kind of I feel like once you get past that, the doors open up and you're just like, oh, it's Ruby. And you learn a lot more about Ruby. And it's, it's like, it's kind of renewed my vigor of like Ruby and being a Rubyist. And I know a lot of people who've worked in Rails for a couple of years and they're like, oh, I'm so bored. Like I, I get it, you know? I think as developers, we get kind of bored of things and want to try something new, which there's nothing wrong with. But I guess I just kind of like have had this reawakening of using Ruby with Rails because of putting things in lib. And, it's really fun. And it's all, I, I really think about this, and I think it's really liberating when you just have this blank directory and you just put anything in there, which I think you can create bad named code, but you can change it. And there's something like really nice about that, where you know the conventions and you know them like the back of your hand, but you're ready for something that's a little more challenging, a little something different, and Lib is super great for that. Also, fast test, you gotta go so fast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>